everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday morning. I am Dr. Abby Ovalade. I'm a family medicine physician in San Diego, California at Shark Ceiling Medical Group. And this topic is going to be a discussion of COVID care in the outpatient setting. And I am very honored to be joined by my friend, Dr. Peter Chin Hong. And I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself, Peter. Thanks so much, Abby. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Peter Chen Hong. I'm from the University of California, San Francisco, and it's such a great pleasure to join Dr. Ululade uh, in this important conversation. Thank you so much, Peter. And this presentation is supported by an unrestricted grant from Pfizer. And so let's get right into it. We can go to the next slide. So although it's difficult, or it would have been difficult to imagine three years ago, COVID-19 is here to stay and has become a part of our everyday medical practice. And because of that, it's very important that we have the tools that we need in order to properly manage it. And that's what we would like you to learn by the end of this presentation. We want you to feel very confident in your ability to determine who needs to be treated for COVID, what they need to be treated with, and also how to recognize and overcome any barriers that may arise in your treating your patients. And so essentially what I will start with is what we experience every day at my clinic, which is a message in my inbox or a phone call from a patient stating that they've tested positive for COVID. And what we have in place, which has been extremely helpful, are triage protocols. And what happens is one of our triage nurses or um, personnel is the first point of contact for the patient. And what they're trying to do is trying to assess whether this is a patient that needs to be referred emergently to the ER. And essentially they're asking about severe symptoms, if they have hypoxia, for example, if they have shortness of breath, which is severe enough to interfere with their activities of daily living, they have persistent chest pain, those are patients that are going to be referred to the emergency room. And now for every other patient, the decision has to be made as to whether to treat them via telemedicine or whether to bring them into the clinic. And essentially, if they don't have any of those symptoms of chest pain or shortness of breath, then they can be managed by telemedicine. And most patients actually can be managed by telemedicine. But if you are concerned about them in any way, then you can either bring them into clinic or you can refer them to the urgent care. And of course, as you're doing that, it's important because we know that there are many other viruses, for example, that are circulating. And we also know that COVID may be incidental to something else that might be going on. So there may be a patient that may have a CHF exacerbation, for example, or a COPD exacerbation. And so it's important that you are trying to think about excluding those other conditions. And now segueing into testing, which of course will help you with this, we know that testing is not required, but it's certainly recommended. And what do you think about that, Peter? Yes, Abby, I think that testing is not necessary up front. Um, you don't want it to be a barrier, certainly for some people getting access to treatment. In my own practice, uh, the person already has that test because they've done a, a you know, rapid test at home. It's not necessary to uh, confirm that. And even if they don't have the test, uh, you can call it, you know, assess them and then decide whether or not you wanted to really confirm that up front. Again, speed is everything with Paxlovid and with some of these early therapies. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. That is so important. And it's also important for you to assess the patient's home setting. So you want to make sure that they have the support that they need at home. And if they don't have the support that they can get it quickly, and all of this is important, we often get asked about things like home oxygen monitoring. And the way to think about that is it's an additional value. If it's there, if the patient has it, then it's an additional way in which you can assess the patient. But it's definitely not required because a lot of these tests are not, uh, well, essentially a lot of these monitors are not necessarily validated. And so it's not necessarily required, but if it's there, it can certainly be helpful. And so now we can go on to the next slide. All right. Now, so in determining who to treat, essentially it's people that are considered a higher risk of getting severe illness from COVID and that could end up hospitalized or they could die from COVID essentially. And so when you look at that broadly, it's people of course that are symptomatic. So you wanna make sure that you're treating a patient that has symptoms. That's a common question from patients. They may test positive, but not have symptoms. So it's people that have symptoms and are in the mild to moderate category of symptoms. So of course that qualifies them for outpatient treatment. And broadly people that are unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated, those are people that are considered to be of higher risk. And age greater than 50 years, which increases in terms of the risk um, as you go above 65, but broadly age greater than 50 years, those patients you definitely want to be thinking about treating. And then people with conditions that are put them at a risk of severe complications or higher risk of severe complications. So they may not be um, in this category of being unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated. They may be younger than 50 years old, but they have conditions that may put them at risk of getting severe illness from COVID. And so that's definitely very important to remember. And also think about the patients that are immunocompromised. They would fall into this category as well. All right, we can go to the next slide. So I put this slide up because if you are like me and you are looking up who to treat for COVID-19, essentially this slide is inevitably going to come up and can be confusing. When you look at it, it's very detailed. It could potentially be cumbersome. So it's important to remember that this is actually a prioritization and it's from the NIH. It's a prioritization of who to treat. So in the event, for example, that there's a shortage of therapeutics, then you go to this to try to prioritize who to treat. But broadly, you want to be thinking um, about essentially the patients that we mentioned in that prior slide. And so let's go to the next slide. All right. And of course, this speaks for itself. Essentially, these are the underlying medical conditions that are associated with being at higher risk for severe illness from COVID. And you can see that of course, age puts you at that high risk, especially age greater than 65 years of age, um, people that have asthma. One thing that stands out to me is that people that are in that BMI category of greater than 30, it actually will put a lot of people into that category. So people that are physically inactive. So, essentially many, many people will need to be treated. And so it's very, very important that we get them the treatment that they need as quickly as possible. And so Peter, how would you summarize the evidence that we have available in terms of why it's important to treat patients with antivirals and what the goals of treatment are? So the goals of treatment, Abby, is really to prevent serious disease, hospitalization and death. And the way I look at this, chart is really, it's pretty much everybody uh, who is probably in a clinic right now. If you think about some of those risk factors that you don't normally think about, like smoking, physical inactivity, uh, obesity, uh, HIV, uh, and mental health issues, it, it pretty much covers almost everybody. So I guess the onus is on uh, who not to treat rather than who to treat because it's almost everybody. And again, we're trying to prevent serious disease, hospitalization, and death. Absolutely. And I did want to also mention that in the pediatric population, when we're thinking about who would be at higher risk of severe illness, then it's very similar. So children that may have congenital heart conditions, neurologic conditions, and also the BMI greater than the 95 percentile for age and gender. And so that's 
really what you want to be thinking about when it comes to the pediatric population. All right, so we'll go to the next slide. Great, so thanks, Abby. I'm gonna take over this slide and really just talk about the way I think about the order and my top three, or how do I think about the priority of which drug to give based on the data. So basically somebody comes in with a positive test, they may have mild symptoms. And again, um, sometimes with immune compromised patients, uh, I give them the benefit of doubt and I may not be that strict about symptoms because I'm not really sure if they may you know, progress very, very quickly. So the first thing is, uh, do they need to be hospitalized or not? And, and that's going to be in your triage, or as uh, Dr. Ululade said, do you need to see them in clinic uh, and assess them? Between three to five days, again, my first choice is going to be Nermatrelavir, Ritonavir, or Paxlovid. And that's based on data showing uh, about an 89% uh, um, efficacy in preventing uh, hospitalization or death. Uh, even in the real world, it's above 50%. When you mix vaccinated and unvaccinated, that population was mainly unvaccinated in the first trials, but then there were uh, more real world studies. The second choice is going to be uh, remdesivir. It's only given IV right now. So that patient uh, would have to come in uh, three consecutive days to get uh, three infusions, uh, one per day. Uh, that's based on studies showing that it's about 87% effective in preventing uh, serious disease, hospitalization, and death. And that's given within the first seven days. So uh, again, if you if the patient is going on a little bit longer uh, and you really want to give them something, uh, you can actually go up to seven days with remdesivir. And the third choice is molnupirvir, which is about a 30% efficacy when you look at the trials. The way that these drugs are prioritized is based on the studies. But again, you may have different factors that make you choose one over the other. For example, if the patient has very, very tough drug interactions, and we'll talk a little bit about that, you may want to choose remdesivir over uh, nomotrelivir, ritonavir, which is Paxlovid. But again, I gen generally go for Paxlovid first, three pills twice a day, make sure the drug interactions are okay. You don't really need to know about uh, GFR upfront, although if you do know it, uh, you can adjust it. But again, uh, don't need to know that as a barrier uh, before pre prescribing it. So again, Paxlovid, uh, Remdesivir, and then Molopurvir. Next slide. So there are a few uh, myths about, uh, you know, early therapy for COVID that uh, Abby and I thought we'd want to, you know, debunk. The first is cost. Um, even though the public health emergency uh, or the, the, on a national level is going to end on May 11th, the government's actually prepaid for about a billion doses. Uh, only about 12 million doses have been uh, distributed so far. So that leaves a lot more. And basically we're gonna get it free, we think until they run out. Uh, in California, we know for sure until November 11th, we'll, everyone, regardless of ability to pay, is going to have access to some of these early therapies. So cost, I know patients are gonna ask you about it, it's not really a consideration. The second myth is finding a pharmacy. Um, I think in a metropolitan area, it's pretty easy. There are multiple pharmacies that can give it. But I know from uh, community reports and, and some more rural settings, it's harder to find. So we've provided some resources for folks to look up pharmacies in the area if it's not an automatic thing, uh, particularly when you're looking at uh, other drugs like molecular Um The third myth is a uh, patient not sick enough or too young. Uh, like uh, Dr. Oluladi showed with that chart, almost everyone qualifies. So in general, I would generally think about age 50 and above uh, with any risk factor. Def the older you are, the more important it is to take. If you're unvaccinated, it's more important, but uh, real world data again shows that vaccinated people can have benefit. Um, and again, in terms of the age, over 28 days from remdesivir, uh, eight, 28 days old. Uh, so pretty much everybody can get remdesivir. Uh, Paxlovid or nomotrelivir, ritonavir, over the age of 12 is authorized, and then molopurvir, authorized to over the age, age of 18. Next myth, uh, no need to wait uh, for the GFR. So a lot of times, even from pharmacists in the community, uh, I get asked, you know, are you okay with the uh, renal function? And the answer is always yes, 
um, in general, uh, you don't have to uh, wait for the creatinine clearance or know what the creatinine is for your patient before prescribing it. Uh, and there have been multiple sets of guidelines uh, regarding that. And the next one is, uh, I think, probably the most important one, this whole idea of rebound. Uh, it's in the community. I know people, Dr. Fauci had it, President Biden had it, Jill, Jill Biden had it. Uh, the more and more we look at data and more, the most recent data shows that about 12 to 18 percent of people suffer some sort of rebound. Nobody is sicker when they have rebound. Nobody gets hospitalized, a oh, very, very low chance. And the most important fact is that people who don't take drug, who are in the placebo arm, also get rebound too. So if you check it, uh, it is more of a COVID phenomenon. We don't call it Paxlovid rebound, we don't call it, uh, you know, early therapy rebound anymore. We call it COVID rebound because it's seen in both uh, patients who take and don't take uh, early therapy. Next slide. Take it over, uh, Dr. Olduladi. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Chin Hong. So just to touch on a few things that you had mentioned, which I thought were really, really great. Those therapeutics locators are very, very helpful. And especially in my clinic, a lot of times they, it may not be available at one pharmacy. And so I'm able to just pull up those two and I have them side by side and you can put in your zip code and really it helps patients um, and it reduces that barrier to access. And then, um, and actually if we can go back one more slide, I think that this will be helpful um, to actually, uh, to actually let's go back one more and then there we go. Um, so one point that I wanted to make was that when it comes to pharmacists um, and their ability to prescribe, so the FDA actually requires that there is some access to the electronic health record of the patient. And so that's something that does come up because we actually have our pharmacists prescribe this medication to patients and that's actually part of our triage protocol and has been very helpful. And of course our pharmacy um, colleagues have been doing such a great job with this, but you may have um, that requirement where you at least have to have access to their record. And if you're not able to, then you do need to consult with the patient's medical provider. And then when it comes to um, the patients that are under 12 years of age, just like you said, uh, Dr. Chin Hong, yes, remdesivir would be that medication um, in that category. And then with the molnupiravir, um, it is contraindicated in the event of pregnancy. Is that correct, Peter? Yes, uh, in general, we probably, there's not enough reliable data for, uh, you know, these early, th well, at least with uh, uh, Paxlovid and molnupiravir with pregnancy. We certainly want, wouldn't want to give molnupiravir and, and pregnancy. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's go on to the next slide. And so essentially another myth is the role of steroids and antibiotics. So we do see that people prescribe these medications unnecessarily. So there's really no role for their treatment solely for COVID by itself. Um, so it's very important that we, we realize that certainly in some cases, if someone, for example, is having an asthma exacerbation and you need to prescribe this, then um, of course it may be appropriate. And so that's also something to remember. And of course, the biggest one that you know I see um, in my clinic is drug interactions. This is the biggest reason by far that I see is, um, it, it, this is the biggest reason why people are very hesitant to prescribe these antivirals. And so it's important that we talk about how to manage that. So essentially it's very important for you to have a drug interaction checker. That's very important. That's something that I also have pulled up on the side. I think that Medscape has one of the best out there because it's very easy to use. You can, you know, just put in one medication after the other. It tells you why they're interacting. And of course, in some cases, it may be because it's increasing the concentration of one medication and decreasing the concentration. So that's very, very helpful information. You also have the University of Liverpool um, drug interaction checker that's available to you. And so the important things to remember um, is that there are some medications that are completely contraindicated. So one example would be amiodarone. So that's a medication that you would want to use a different antiviral for, for example. Um, and then there are also some medications that you can reduce the dose or adjust the doses of. Um, and so that's also something to 
realize you can actually do that. Uh, you can also hold some medications while you are treating the patient for COVID with an antiviral, and then you can restart it two to three days afterward. And so that's very, very important. Some medications that you hold have a longer half-life, so you may need to hold it for a little bit longer. Or if the patient's really, really um, old, older, then you can also hold that medication for a longer period of time. And of course, this is where our pharmacy colleagues can be very helpful. So it's very important that you consult with the pharmacist. You can also consult with the specialist. So for example, the cardiologist, if you have a medication like Plavix, for example, you can consult with them. But it's important that you not withhold the treatment for these reasons, because there are other things that are available. And so we can go on to the next slide. So at my clinic, we actually have a group chat that's going, and that's one of the things that we've instituted after COVID that's been really helpful. And so a real life question that actually came up in terms of an example was a patient that was an 83 year old patient that had a normal GFR and they were on Plavix because they had stents that were placed. And so my colleague was saying, well, how have you all addressed this in the past? So of course, I directed them to the drug interaction checker and it came up that there was this contradiction, of course, which was very easy to pull up. And so Dr. Chin Hong, what do you think is the best course of action here? Yeah, so I think, you know, if, if it's an absolute contraindication, uh, you know, that that you find, I would think about alternatives like, uh, again, going down the list, if you can get an infusion center available in your area, uh, I would give remdesivir for three days. Um, because again, if the patient is, again, you always have to think it's the juice with the squeeze. Is the patient in a really high risk group, the older they are, the, the more comorbidities they are, the harder I'm going to try. Remdesivir for three days or molecular uh, if they're not of childbearing potential is what I would use as alternatives. Absolutely. And that was really great. That was actually what ended up uh, happening, which was really great um, for the patient who did really well. And another scenario was a 25 year old patient who um, was on birth control, but was on carbamazepine, which is an anti-seizure medication. And in this case, what would you recommend? Well, if the 25 year old otherwise looks pretty healthy, uh, I'm not sure I would necessarily treat that patient. But if the patient had, uh, you know, seizure disorder, again, might be kind of in the and symptomatic. Uh, again, I would go through the same algorithm as with the previous patient. Uh, can you have access to an infusion center uh, one, once a day for three days of IV remdesivir? Uh, with a 25-year-old, if I'm prescribing molecular, I'd have to make sure that the patient uh, is negative on a pregnancy test and is not, uh, you know, going to, is not trying to become, uh, uh, you know, trying to make, uh, get a child in, in the next, you know, around the time of taking the meds, because it's, again, contraindicated for uh, molecular. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really, really great. Thank you so much for that. And so essentially this slide is summarizing, summarizing all of that. So essentially you can do different things when it comes to drug drug interactions. You can watch for potential adverse events. You can address the dose of the medication if it's appropriate. For example, I've seen this with a medication like Xarelto. You could withhold it um, potentially. And then you could, of course, also use an alternative antiviral. And so that's very, very important to remember. All right, let's go to the next slide. So essentially, this is the summary which is that it's very, very helpful if you have a protocol in place for assessing patient acuity. Essentially, it's important that you have prepared for that because you're going to get a lot of people that are calling in that they've tested positive for COVID. And so that's very important. We have more and more people testing at home. So it's important that you have this. If you don't have a triage nurse, for example, you could have voicemail prompts so that when your patients call in, they can self-select. You can also have that on your email messaging so that you can 
see how they would go through all of that and say, well, I need to go into the ER at this point. At least that way, that is something that is helpful for patients and also helpful for you because it helps to streamline things. And if the patient fits criteria for treatment, prescribe antivirals. Don't hesitate to do that. It's very important because we know that the goals are to reduce the chances of them getting up hospitalized or getting severely ill from COVID. And so don't hesitate to prescribe. And of course, there are many challenges that are related to this, many barriers that may come up. And so it's important that you are prepared for these scenarios as they come out. And when in doubt, consult. So always make sure that you are in touch with your consultants, whether it is great infectious disease doctors like Dr. Chen Hong, also our pharmacy colleagues, uh, the oncologists, cardiologists, um, all of these are very important to have on hand so that if you have questions, you can get these answered. And so that will end our presentation part. All right, so I'm sure that there are some questions in the chat. Let's see. I don't see any quite yet. Can I uh, add to um, the last slide what you presented, Abby? Of course, of course, please. I think I just wanted to emphasize a few other points as well. I mean, uh, we hadn't talked about long COVID, but as some people uh, re remember that there is uh, some data showing that by taking early therapy, uh, particularly with uh, norotronavir or Paxlovid, it can reduce in an observational trial the risk of long COVID by as much as 26%. So I think uh, you know that that is another way in which you can talk to to patients about uh, using some of these early therapies. And again, one other question I had, Abby, is about equity. And uh, do you have any thoughts about about that and your understanding about uh, Paxlovid? Absolutely. So it's very important that we really think about this just as a healthcare system in general, because we know that there are many studies that show that there are disparities in terms of treatment. And it is the same disparities that we see across other parts of medicine, the same patients, um, group of patients who tend to be affected by this. So patients that are minorities, um, patients that may not have access to pharmacies. We know that there are more and more pharmacy deserts that um, have been created because of the socioeconomic factors. So all the things that cause uh, disparities in terms of the social uh, determinants of health are going to affect all of this. So it's important that we start to think about that and really create solutions around this because it definitely is a big issue. And um, also, um, I, what I also uh, wanted to mention is it's very important that we remind patients that once they have been treated, they should make sure that they become up to date on their vaccines. And that's very, very important. And so there are now some new recommendations in terms of the booster. So it's important that once they've recovered, that we make sure that they are getting updated in terms of their protection. And of course, don't forget all the isolation criteria. So we should be telling these our patients that they should isolate when they test positive. And so that's another important point that we want to emphasize as well. All right, so I see a question. Do you have any anecdotal experience with side effects of Paxlovid in the geriatric population? So I actually haven't seen any significant side effects in my population of patients. I haven't heard of significant side effects um, or really adverse effects. Uh, so I, I don't think that this has been a significant issue just overall in terms of the reporting when it comes to these medications. Patients request them and they tolerate them very, very well. Let's see. I mean, the one thing that people complain about, of course, is Paxlovid in mouth, which is just kind of a difference in taste. But unlike, uh, you know, taste disturbances with COVID, it goes away completely, uh, even as the pill, you know, goes through its half-life. Uh, it, so again, don't be dissuaded by that. Awesome. That's really great. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for participating in this. And we hope that this has been very helpful for your practice. And... Everyone have a really great week. Thank you. Have a great week.